Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending the Scholarship Opportunities Programs Workshop. Um, we are student advisors at this office. My name is Aline. I'm a second year education sciences major and sociology minor specializing in children's development. And I am in my second year now here at SOP. So I'm very excited to present this workshop, even if it's virtual. I hope it helps you all. Hi everyone, my name is Kiefer. Um, I'm a fourth year English, uh, English business major here at UCI. Um, I specialize in creative writing, um, helping, write, uh, write, helping edit and write drafts for people's essays, as well as advising for scholarship opportunities program, of course, of course, which is what we are here to help you with today. So um, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sophia. I'm a third year biochemistry and molecular bio major. Um, this is my third year working at the scholarship opportunities program. And I also work at the at another like um, part of our the DUE, which is the Writing Center. Okay, so this workshop we will guide you through the process of submitting a pre-application for prestigious scholarships in our upcoming Trailblazers Ten cycle, which refers to spring slash summer. Again, um, mm -hmm. if you guys have any questions. Uh... Don't be afraid to put them in chat. I will be answering questions throughout the presentation as well as at the end of the presentation. Okay, so to get started, in April, juniors, seniors, and recent graduates may submit pre-applications for the Trailblazers 10 advising for 10 awards for use after graduation in the US or abroad, including graduate study awards and our most popular award, which is the Fulbright US Student Program, which includes the English Teaching Assistantship or ETA, Binational Business Internship, and the Traditional Study slash Research Grant. Students work intensively with our staff and writing specialists over the summer, and applications are submitted to external scholarship agencies in early fall. The T10 scholarship candidates are juniors or graduating seniors, according to year of graduation, so not your units. Graduating seniors who plan to start graduate programs next fall are not eligible, unfortunately, because um, they will be going off to grad school. Please let us know if you need tips for how to find the fellowships advisor at your new school who will have jurisdiction to advise and nominate you as a graduate student. Undergrad international exchange students who will receive bachelor's degrees from other universities should also apply through your home institutions, not through UCI. And the italicized awards on this slide are um, require or strongly encourage campus evaluation and endorsement of enrolled undergraduate applicants. To note, some scholarships do not require um, campus nomination, for example, Gates Cambridge, NSF. Shoresman, Knight Hennessy, and Soros. Regardless of the nomination requirement, applicants are encouraged to work with our advisors who will provide constructive and insightful feedback and access to resources, such as past money applications, that will strengthen your personal and professional development as well as your application. So these scholarships are not just about the money, but also about personal development. Students grow a great deal through the process of applying, and even those who don't win will learn strategies that help them get placed in top graduate schools and enter into excellent careers. Our primary advisors and student advisors serve as guides throughout all phases of the application process and encourage you to develop lifelong skills. In phase one, exploration, you will use pre-writing activities to uncover an insights about scholarships and yourself that you can use to develop an application strategy. In the mapping phase, you'll connect your insights and goals to the application requirements for a specific scholarship, for example, Fulbright. In the trailblazing phase, you will develop and refine a unique approach to the writing prompts for the scholarship, and a primary advisor provides comprehensive feedback to support your revisions. In the climbing phase, candidates demonstrate growth and share their new perspective with informed experts at a campus endorsement or nomination interview, which will probably be held online this year. In finally, the making your mark phase, candidates finalize their narratives and complete their journeys by submitting materials to the external scholarship agency. Fantastic. So 
Going into phase one, uh, the exploration phase, um, this fall, SOP launched a new online course uh, for potential prestigious scholarship applicants. Um, the course is known as SOP Prep. So this valuable resource um, supports sophomores to recent graduates as well, uh, although freshmen are able, are able to access and take this course as well, um, in developing self-awareness of their intellectual and practical leadership value, uh, values and goals. Um, during the exploration phase, uh, which in the exploration phase envelops SOP prep. Um, prospective scholarship candidates watch videos and complete journal assignments targeting specific learning objectives. Um, they will learn to A, describe models of intellectual um, and practical leadership, B, articulate discipline um, specific educational goals and match them with key resources, and C, draft a time management plan. Um, during SOP prep, our student advisors will provide personalized feedback and encouragement for each of these journal entries along the way. Um, once SOP prep has been completed, um, the, candidate, um, the candidate who is taking SOP prep enters the mapping phase of the application, the application process. Um, during the mapping phase, candidates will write a vision statement for, for future original contributions, take a virtual advisor quiz in Qualtrics to match them with, uh, with specific scholarship offerings that we have here in the SOP office. Um, and then have a personalized advising consultation with one of our student advisors or primary advisors um, who will help you get started with our pre-application forms. So what is the SOP prep, uh, what are the specifics of the SOP prep course? Um, the SOP prep course is intended for UCI undergraduates with sophomore or higher standing and a cumulative GPA of at least 3.0. Um, recent UCI, grad, UCI graduates and freshmen uh, as well may also participate if they're within four quarters from graduation. Um, this course is open entry, open exit, meaning that there's um, that you do not need permission to enroll or withdraw from the course. Um, there are no deadlines for any of the assignments, and there is no um, academic impact of taking this course um, and not completing the assignments. Um, this course does not provide any academic credit. Um, we're hoping that through this course, we can inspire undergraduates to get started with graduate school and career planning, as well as encouraging building relationships with our advising team and learning more about SOP within the remote learning environment. Um, we're actually going to put the enrollment link into chat. I can copy that right now for you. Unless actually, oh, fantastic. Um, Sophia already got in there for you guys. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, so yeah, if you if you're interested if um, if you're interested in taking the first step to get involved and enroll in the scholarship opportunities program, um, go ahead and click on the enrollment link in the chat, um, and that will it puts it into your Canvas instructor alongside all your other courses, um, and this should allow you to begin the process of working towards the pre-application for one of the scholarships of your choice. So SOP prep, um, again, this is an overview of what it should look like in your Canvas. Um, there's only, uh, only four of the assignments require 300 word responses. Um, you, can, you can take breaks in between these. You can take as much time as you'd like to complete these 300 word responses. We have some students who will complete it within a period of three to five hours um, on one day, all in one day. Um, so it's really, it's, you, it's completed at your own pace. Um, the only deadline is that the pre-application for the, for the spring application cycle closes April 12th. Um, so SOP prep must be completed um, in order to gain access to the pre-application to apply for these, to apply for many of these scholarships and involve yourself further in the SOP process. Um, so yeah, as a, again, the deadline is April 12th on Monday. So you have, I believe, two weeks to complete it. Um, and just as a note, if you are interested in the Schwarzman Scholarship, the deadline has already passed. It was March 9. Um, this is because the Schwarzman Scholars um, has an earlier deadline, so we external deadline. So we had to have an earlier pre-application deadline for it. Um, yeah, and I'll link the pre-application link in the chat as well. So you guys can apply. Here we go. We can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so how do you get started with the pre-application? Um, a lot of the time when students look at the pre-application, they're really overwhelmed because there are a lot of questions, um, but we just wanna notify you that it is designed to be short. So 
it's really just a simple form to express your interest in applying these scholarships. Um, emphasize on your interest. You don't have to, it's not a firm commitment to apply to the specific award. We just really want to know what your academic plans are, your career goals, and why specifically you want to apply to some certain awards. Um, so after you meet, or sorry, after you submit your pre-application, uh, an advisor, a scholarship advisor will meet with you. So not um, any of us three, but actually um, the scholarship advisors, Courtney, Brendan, and or Rose, they'll contact you. Um, and they'll discuss the available scholarships and how to select the best letter writers, um, provide relevant resources, and as you develop your personal statement and your proposal essay. Yeah, so we'll be breaking down the different components of the pre-application so you guys have some tips on what to include on the form. Um, and if you have any problems with the pre-application, please email us, um, the SOP team, um, as soon as possible so we can get your problem addressed and fixed. And I'll send the email in the chat as well. Okay, now on to planning your future for grad and career programs. Now, graduate school plans, you wanna be as specific as possible in these applications for the scholarships because undergraduate education is broad and exploratory, but for grad school, you'll narrow and deepen your interests and will work more closely with a specific faculty member. Some scholarships have restrictions on majors or degree types that you can pursue. Your preference for studying in the US or abroad can also help pinpoint the right scholarship quickly. So on our website, which we will have a run through of later, Kiefer will go over that, we will show you the breakdown, the two sections of abroad and domestic awards. So if you know for sure that you don't want to leave the United States for graduate school, then you will not be applying to Fulbright, for example. Um, now, moving on. When writing about a specific school or grad program, justify your choice. It, is it a unique program that is not offered at other institutions? Or if it's abroad, is it not typically offered in the US? If you can identify a professor you would want to research to work with. The overall reputation of the university is less important than finding the right faculty members that will mentor and advise you if you are accepted into the scholarship program. Now, once you identify this professor that you wanna work with, feel free to reach out to them. If anything, you're gonna to have to in order to get like a letter of affiliation, for example. You can introduce yourself, your expertise, why you're interested in the program and your interests in working with them. You can even request an in informational interview or ask questions to learn more about if this grad program is right for you. It'll give you a better idea if this professor is willing to advise and mentor you if you're accepted into the program. You can also reach out to past alumni or current students involved or students currently involved in that program to gauge if it's best fit for you. Lastly, you should look to see if this grad program has advanced opportunities that will contribute to your own personal development, such as learning cohort or mentorship programs. Now, scholarship agencies really want to see a clear and definite outline of what you plan to do in grad school and how it relates to your future career goal. So all, all of your application materials like personal statements and statement of grant purposes will be tailored to, towards this central question. Um, for career plans, you want to ask yourself, have you pinpointed your exact career goal? It's okay if you haven't, but for the pre-op, include as much information as you know. If you are unsure, list all the career paths that you're considering. As you're thinking about your future, reflect on your academic, leadership, and personal experiences and interests, and whether or not you can tie your interests and experiences into your future goals. And finally, if you're unsure still about your career plans, we recommend attending advising or workshop events at the Division of Career Pathways at UCI. Their services are free to undergrad students, and after graduation, you're required to pay a fee for their services. So take advantage of it now and definitely check out, check them out before it's too late. Number two, selecting your scholarships. So how do you know which scholarship of the 21 that we advise for is right for you? Um, you'll be asked to choose which ones you intend to apply to this summer and ideally you want to be able to narrow down this list to one or two scholarships and in order to make this decision you have to know your graduate program and career plans which we just discussed do your research about the scholarship and its selection criteria look into what type of 
applicant these scholarship agencies are looking for, because most have recent winter bios on their websites, which is very helpful. This is a good opportunity to check out the SOP winners blog or view our past winning application binders on a job in basis. So right now they're all online. And if you start advising with a student advisor or a primary advisor, we can give you access to these past winning apps. But in person, there would be a physical binder that you could come in and check out um, at our office. Now, um, when viewing these past winning apps, look at what they require to apply. I mean, sorry, when looking at the scholarship criteria, you want to figure out if it requires a personal statement, a type of proposal, et cetera. And knowing these different components can prepare you for what to write in your pre-app. For instance, if you're applying to the Marshall Scholarship, research the different UK grad institutions and programs. And after identifying which ones you're interested in, it'll allow you to write why you're interested in that program and look at what that program, look at what that program wants in a grad student and start tailoring your application to that um, model. Now, what if you're still unsure about which programs to select after all of this? This is just the initial stage, so feel free to select as many scholarships as you're interested in on your pre-app. Your scholarship advisor will work with you to narrow down which scholarships best fit your interests and career goals. Then you can apply to multiple awards, but we discourage applying to more than two scholarships in one summer. They require a lot of research, reflection, commitment, and dedication to produce a winning application. In addition, they require additional work on your end to produce curated materials for each scholarship, and your letter writers will have to write multiple different letters for you as well. Okay, so um, considering competitiveness um, for SOP, uh, there's a lot of questions um, revolving this. A lot of students when coming to the program being that these are uh, 20, uh, 21 of the most prestigious, uh, they're prestigious, they're, um, I'm sorry, they're, ac they're based on academics and, um, I I'm, 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 I'm coming up with a loss for the word for, I'm so sorry right now. Um, but anyway, so looking at the competitive, uh, factors of the scholarships, um, uh, full disclosure, um, having a 3.5 or higher GPA will make you the most competitive when applying for these scholarships. Um, they can, the, the, the first thing that they look at is GPA before they look at anything else. Um, and they will, the students who have a 3.5 or higher will be more competitive, which um, for a lot of the scholarships, uh, we highly recommend having um, a higher GPA. Um, big federal programs like the Fulbright and NSF are designed to increase academic, uh, uh, to increase access to graduate education for US students. Um, and while they are prestigious, um, they're a little bit less competitive. Um, so I believe a 3.0 or higher for these scholarships um, would, um, is appropriate. Um, Fulbright being that it, it has some, we give out, over, there, so not we, uh, there are over a thousand Fulbright awards given out every year. Um, we have multiple students uh, in each application cycle every year receive Fulbright awards. Um, so it is the most accessible of our awards to apply for. Um, with over 150 different host countries, um, Fulbright offers uh, just a really fantastic, flexible award, uh, a very achievable award for many students. Um, these awards are, they're, they're well-funded. Um, again, yeah, they grant thousands of awards every year. Um, we recommend having at least one year of experience uh, related to your uh, future graduate major before applying for either the Fulbright or NSF. Um, small privately funded programs such as the Knight Hennessy and Soros um, are very are very competitive. So usually the, the awards that, the, the programs that are awarding uh, less scholarships uh, every year are the more competitive ones. Um, winning ones such as Knight Hennessy and Soros um, is not as, it's not as rare as like being struck by lightning um, but it's, it, they're very rare. They're, it's very, it's, you have to be a highly motivated, high achieving student in order to receive these scholarships. Uh, we recommend a 3.7 or higher GPA for a uh, scholarship program such as the Knight Hennessy and Soros. Um, and we also recommend a, having a strong uh, record and history of leadership, um, as well as involvement in many different um, facilities at UCI and in, in your schooling years. Um, the, when you're when applying for these scholarships, you should be already known across campus in many different offices as a leader among among students, essentially. Um, so um, if you're looking to fund a PhD program, um, know that the most the most good doctoral programs fully fund incoming students through their advisors, research grants and teaching assistantship programs. 
Um, winning one of these awards will add prestige and give the independence to choose your own research topic. So many of our research awards um, are, for are for students who have already done research under a professor, have an idea for their own research as to how, what they, uh, as something, as a project they'd like to pursue for their career um, and are looking to receive funding um, for their project. Um, so winning one of these awards adds not only adds prestige, but also gives you the independence to choose your own research topic and also connects you to other top researchers and leaders within your field of study. Um, the money itself likely won't make the big difference between you being able to go to graduate school or not, but it will make the difference in whether or not you'll be able to pursue um, your research project um, that you proposed for graduate school. So yeah, um, any questions so far? I don't see any in chat, so I'm going to move into the next slide. Um, if you have any questions regarding competitiveness, I know we have usually have quite a few around this. Um, feel free to put them in chat or save them until the end, and we'll get to those. Okay, so um, um, regarding Fulbright country competitiveness, um, if you're applying for Fulbright, it's highly imperative that you look into country specific statistics um, because the competitiveness um, for this scholarship application uh, differs um, from country to country depending on where you are applying. Um, you can analyze how many awards they have available um, based on how many students apply it on average each year and how many students are actually granted those awards. Um, from the Fulbright US Student Program website, um, at the, on the top right of the website, um, you can click statistics. Um, uh, just make sure you're using the student program website, not the scholar program, which is for professors. Um, so I believe I'll paste this in chat for you guys. This is the website for the Fulbright statistics. And so you can view a lot of um, how many students receive the award versus how many students apply versus how many awards that they have available um, to give out to students. Um, they have, um, we have both recipients and alternates uh, for awards. So um, recipients and uh, recipients, alternates and finalists, I believe. So recipients are the students who will be receiving the award of the year um, that they apply for it. Um, alternates are students who um, received an award but are either waiting for the funding or are waiting for an award to become available for them to, to receive um, their award. And then finalists are students who made it into the final, I believe, the final decision process um, for these awards, um, but will not be receiving, but uh, will not be receiving an award or will based on funding. If, if you could straighten me a little bit on that, Aline. Yeah, so sometimes people are alternates because there's limited funding, but if more funding becomes available, then they'll be bumped up to finalist or award recipient. Mm -hmm. oh, what's the difference between finalist and award recipient? Um, same thing, but finalist is the first time they're awarded that title, like they are for sure getting the Fulbright scholarship if they accept it, whereas alternate, you know, depends on the situation. Okay, thank, thank you for clarifying that, Aline. Um, so yeah, on average, um, Fulbright host countries select about 19 to 20% of their applicants to receive grants. Um, looking beyond the United Kingdom, uh, which is the most popular country uh, for application and, and therefore the most competitive, um, Ireland, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are growing increasingly competitive um, with acceptance rates below 10%. Um, if you speak a foreign language, uh, we, highly, we highly encourage you to consider countries, uh, other countries that are non-English speaking countries. Um, some countries such as Israel have a marked difference in competitiveness between their study and research grant as well as their e and their English teaching assistant programs. Um, you might be as th you might be up to three times as likely um, to get funding by switching your grant type, um, but you have must be sure that you are genuinely interested and qualified um, for what you're proposing to do um, as when it comes to the endorsing committee, one of the questions. I noticed that frequently is asked is why did you choose this specific country and what about this country um, made you cho choose it versus any other country? So if, if you're very broad or non-specific with your reasons for choosing your host country, um, that application might not be as strong as an application that knows specifically why they chose that country and why it fits their needs more than any other country um, could, could do so. Um, so yeah, if you click on the countries page um, on the website, um, you can see a clickable map with all the Fulbright host countries. Um, if you click on a country, you'll get detailed summaries for each type of award that this country offers. Um, the Fulbright language skill requirements uh, will also be listed under each uh, host country's summary section. Um, many countries use English as the language of instruction and do not require a foreign language evaluation. Um, however, if you're interested in the country that has 
a language rec requirement or recommendation. Um, it's recommend uh, we uh, you can start learning and practicing it now. Uh, Duolingo is honestly uh, <laughs> there's a lot of jokes about Duolingo, but it works it works really well, especially alongside other courses. Um, so there's a lot of applications and um, resources out there to begin um, dipping your feet in the water for learning a new language. Um, yeah, great. Okay. Um, so the next part of the pre-application will be to, you will have to list out your letter writers. So potential, it doesn't have to be ingrained, but just potential um, people you can contact. Um, you'll have to list out three of them because most of the scholarships will ask for three letter writers. Um, so advice for, for identifying your letter writers, um, the main one is start early. Um, your letter writers will be heavily involved with the scholarship process. Um, and they might be busy in the summer. So it's good to ask in advance, um, especially because they will, um, they will be required to submit a draft of their letter, which will revise and give back to them. So that way we can have the strongest letter for you. Um, second, ask the appropriate people. So what that means is if you're interested in the Fulbright Research Award, make sure you're seeking out professors who have observed your research experience and related coursework. Um, another example is if you're um, applying for the English Teaching Award, seek, prof seek professors or faculty who have supervised you in, and know your writing, mentoring, and tutoring skills. Um, you should schedule an appointment to discuss the letter in detail. So um, in addition to an email, try to schedule like a Zoom meeting with them so you can talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and, and then explain why you are asking them for a letter of recommendation and what you would like to, the letter to include. A lot of professors, I think, will like either interview you or they'll use your resume as a starting point to write your letter. So you can give like when you're talking to them, make sure you're giving them like some points. That way, um, they'll know what specifically what to write about you. Um, and then ask. You can also ask them whether they feel they can write you a strong letter because that is really important. Um, okay, and then last. One is maintain good communication. So it is imperative that you keep your letter writers updated on your progress with the scholarship application materials so they can write a letter that reflects your involvement and your career goals. Um, so some optional things you can include when you contact your um, like professor or any letter writer is you can include a cover letter, a resume, a transcript, a description of the scholarship program, and then a complete list of the deadlines. You can up like you don't have to send this all at once. You can update your letter writer as your draft um, for your scholarship progresses. And you can also update them with your personal statements, proposal, and application form. Thank you so much. I just wanted to add also um, for this, one of the questions I receive very commonly during advising is when, when should um, students begin sending out letters or contacting their professors to get them involved in this process? And um, I honestly, I, I tell a lot of my students hey, to begin involving your professors as soon as you submit your pre-application and decide which scholarships um, you're going to be pursuing. Um, the sooner the sooner you involve them, the better, um, being that when it comes to the endorsement committee part where you're gonna ask that, you're gonna ask a lot of your contacts and recommendations to be on a committee to interview you. Um, many of these professors will be asked to be on multiple committees uh, for different students and they will only have time to do two or three committees because it does take a lot of time, their time um, in order to, to commit to these. Mm -hmm. um, so it they sometimes will have students who will be unable to get certain professors on their committee um, because they've already committed to um, other students' processes. Um, so it's important to get in, um, your contacts and professors at UCI um, involved in this as soon as possible. Okay. So the next part of the pre-application is your proposal. Um, again, I want to reiterate that this the pre-application is really just showing your interest for applying to the scholarship. Um, so I'll give you tips about how to draft your proposal, but know for the pre-application, we want you to write what your ideas are for the proposal, but if it's not fully thought out, it's okay. We're just um, making sure you we know about your interests so we can guide you as best as we can. Okay, um, so the first tip we have is address the prompt and your audience. So some questions to think about, think about who will be reading your proposal, a scholarship board. Um, how familiar are they with your topic? Um, it, it'll depend on the scholarship you're applying to, but we'll guide you through like who your audience may be. Um, and then just thinking about this will allow you to focus and present your ideas in the most effective manner. 
Second point is show relevance to your to current academic debates or developments. So how does your work fit into the ongoing developments in your field? One thing to note is like, for example, if you're applying for an abroad scholarship, why specifically do you want to travel abroad for your like educate for your degree or for your research? Um, sometimes we kind of miss this point because we think we we are interested in going abroad, but um, if you're able to communicate um, how your interests fit into um, current debates or developments, it'll better um, propel your application. And another question you can think about is what new and unique contribution can you make in your field or if there is a knowledge gap you can fill? Okay. Another point is to strategize what details to include. Um, so, of course, you can include your academic merit and any relevant experience, but you can also include extent, um, any intensive knowledge you know about the field. Um, this will just help show, help show um, that you are competent in this field of research and it's okay to not know everything about your interest in the field, that's why you're applying to study there, but just showing, um, knowing, um, showing that you have some knowledge about it will show your interest a little bit better. Okay. Uh, next point is review your proposal with your professors and mentors. Your professors and mentors will most likely have um, more experience in that field that you're interested in. So gaining alternative and additional perspectives on the feasibility of your proposal um, from them is really great. Um, at the Scholarship Opportunities Program, you're, like, we'll guide you through writing your application materials and making it as competitive as possible, but it will be your professors and mentors who know specifically about like if you're doing STEM research, they'll know about that more than us. So it is good to have multiple people as part of your like team of scholarship advisees. Um, for graduate study proposals, you will have to explain your choice of the program, the subfield interest or research questions and or your graduate mentors. So it's important that the scholarship review committees know you have done your research on the graduate programs and why it is the best fit for you specifically. Um, so how you can convey this is just analyze how completing this degree relates to your academic and career goals and how you will use these skills in the real world. Specify your contributions to the graduate cohort. Yeah, um, for other proposals, you can also mention inspirations or other works that relates to you. And you can, like, although your plans are not set in stone, it is always, um, it always looks better to a scholarship committee if you are specific as possible about your plan. So in this way, you can convince your audience you have the skills and motivations to complete the work. Um, and lastly, think about how create your creative projects can advance society and culture and offer insight about positive real world impact. Um, Joshua, I just saw your question in the chat and we recommend no more than two. Most applicants do one, but Seldom do you see more than two because they are quite rigorous. Okay, so going on to creating your narrative, this applies to the proposal Sophia was talking about, but also your personal statement and your overall applicant uh, profile. You want to include what your advisor needs to know um, when you have those initial advising appointments. And from then on, you want to illuminate connections. So show why you're a good fit for the particular program or award show how your experiences and skills fit, and include a range of relevant experiences, such as coursework, research, internships and jobs, mentoring, studying abroad, volunteering, etc. And this is a lot of stuff. So oftentimes you can't fit it all in your personal statement or an application component, so you can elaborate more in your CV, which has a complete list of all your involvements. And you want to um, ask yourself what direction you feel you're going towards when deciding which scholarship to pursue and under that scholarship, which type of award. And you want to review, reveal sophistication and maturity. So demonstration, demonstrate reflection about your goals, talents, and values, which you'll have an opportunity to do right away even before the pre-application in the SOP prep course that we talked about earlier in this workshop. Show how you've learned and grown from your experiences and mistakes and reveal new aspects that can't be found in other parts of the application. So the most important thing I think is to be original 
Um, especially for personal statements, the winning ones, as you will see in the examples that we show you, use very vivid and descriptive storytelling, but at the same time, they're not wordy. They get to the point and they are um, very well organized. You want to look at common everyday events from a different and fresh perspective to turn it into something new. So, you know, um, even if you haven't started the scholarship application process, you don't even know which one you're doing yet, um, just in your daily life, like think about little things that may seem trivial, but are actually very meaningful to you. The things that influence your decisions, um, career and academic wise, and you can build upon those in your personal statement when the time comes. But do eliminate generalizations and cliches. So um, like if you're starting off your, <laughs> personal statement with a very cliche quote that isn't as strong as if you were to start with an anecdote that is unique to yourself. Now on to candidate resources. Now for scholarship advisor meetings, if you're still unsure about your intended grad program or still figuring out how to articulate your career goal in these scholarship essays, don't worry. You'll have an initial meeting with your scholarship advisor. So First, the first person you'll meet will actually be a student advisor, one of us. Um, and then after that, you'll submit your pre-application and be paired with a primary advisor who will guide you through the entire process from beginning to end. And they will discuss um, what you included in your pre-app. So that's why it's important to really be accurate and thorough on that application and try to narrow down the scholarship choices so that it's more efficient for both sides. And consider your audience. What does your advisor need to know about you? So everything that I just said will help you achieve that. The more your advisor knows, the better they can advise, the better they can advise and provide recommendations for you. And as we talked about a little bit before, during this process, you're going to have access to past winning um, applications, the application process overview, the canvas for draft submissions. So you will be placed into a specific canvas course space for the scholarship that you apply to or scholarships, if that's the case. Um, and it is a lot more convenient as opposed to having one huge space for all the applicants through our office. And finally, not only will you be paired with a primary advisor, but you'll also get a writing center specialist who's gonna really go into the nitty gritties of all the writing stuff, grammar, syntax, spelling of your essays. Okay, so for this next section, uh, we're gonna go over the steps of what happens after you submit your pre-application. Um, the first thing is you'll be added to the Canvas course um, to keep you organized. Um, so actually, we'll, just actually start off all this. Um, once you submit your pre-application, there is a committee that will decide whether or not your pre-application will be um, admitted into the actual application process itself or not. Um, and the reasoning for this is once uh, the applications reach the endorsement committee level, um, there's only a certain number of endorsements that can be given out uh, per application um, to the students. And we don't, it would not be, uh, optimal, I guess, uh, for say, for if we were to have 30 applicants for a specific scholarship, uh, and we're only able to give out 10 endorsements, um, we don't want to have 30 students come into the endorsement committee section, of course, um, and then ha have us have to turn away 20 of them simply because not because their applications weren't strong at all, but because we weren't able to give out that many endorsements. So we have a cutoff point after the pre application where we try to um, choose the numbers of applications that will go through the process um, equal to the number of endorsements that we're able to give out because we'd like to, if possible, we'd like to endorse each and every student in the application cycle. Um, that is our goal. So um, after you submit the pre-application and it's been reviewed by the committee and you've been admitted into the application process, um, you'll be added to the Canvas course, um, which will help keep you organized uh, just like any other uh, class course. Um, your first tasks in April will be exploratory. Uh, you'll meet with a personalized advisor, um, so either Courtney, Brendan, or Rose, um, and work on some reflective journaling exercises to help uncover insights about scholarships and yourself uh, that you can use to develop your, your application strategy better, um, including this, which specific awards uh, 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 best match you. Um, in May, uh, you'll begin uh, mapping your insights and goals to a specific application requirements for your scholarship, um, as well as researching your graduate program or host country uh, to better develop your uh, argument uh, for the scholarship that you chose. 
Um, and then in June and July, uh, you'll be, uh, that's why it's called uh, trailblazing. You'll be blazing a trail through your essays uh, with feedback from your SOP advisor and writing specialist. Um, and then if your scholarship requires endorsement from the campus, um, you'll participate in endorsement in, during, in an endorsement er, uh, interview during August. Um, and that's the part that I was talking about where they will uh, interview you with a committee of usually ten, seven to 10 um, people from, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, so seven to 10 of either your personal contacts as well as your peers um, and committee members um, from the Scholarship Opportunities Program and Phi Beta Kappa. Um, Sounds very intimidating. Uh, I promise you it's not nearly as intimidating as it may seem. Um, they're all really just wanting to get to know you better. And um, they, they've already heard about you through this, through this process and a lot of your materials have already been sent to the committee members. Um, and so they're just looking to get to know you better and, and, and get to meet the person um, that they're already so impressed by through all these materials they've been sent. So um, definitely don't, don't, be, don't feel intimidated when approaching these endorsement interviews. Um, it's, it's usually a lot of fun for both the students and, and the interviewers. Um, and then finally, um, you'll reach the summit in September uh, where you submit your uh, finalized scholarship application um, to the external agency or program. Um, and then you wait usually about a month or so and you'll receive news on whether or not you receive it. Um, so let's see. I'm sorry. And then Aline's going to go through some final notes regarding the SOP process. Um, and then any other questions you guys may have, we'll take after that. And we're going to quickly go over the website too. So we're almost done with this workshop. But um, also, quick note some scholarships, a reminder, do not require campus endorsement or they do not offer it. So um, make sure to check on our website which ones um, are which. Okay, so some last notes. This is a long involved process, but completely worth the outcome because not only may you win full graduate funding or an experience abroad, these awards are so prestigious that they will elevate your resume and attract graduate schools and employers. SOP staff will support you throughout the whole process by answering your questions, editing multiple drafts of your application, essays and letters of recommendation, arranging your campus endorsement interview, and finally writing your campus endorsement letter if you are endorsed. Next slide. And just a final note to add on to what Aline said, um, the scholarship application process is like very unique in that you'll have, you, you won't really have another experience where you'll have specific mentors guiding you through writing like an application, whether it be for grad school or a, any other thing, like you'll, you'll have your mentors, but these advisors are specifically for your application. So um, when you do get to there, like make use of the scholarship advisors, like um, in, in, on top of like the scholarship application materials, you can send them your graduate school materials, anything like that, just so you can help, it'll help prepare you to be more, as, more competitive, even if you don't win the scholarship. Yeah, um, if you'd like to learn more, um, this is a slide um, that shows our website, um, and also we'll have one-on-one um, -on -one advising appointments online that you can schedule as well. Um, Great, yeah. thank you so much, Sophia. So um, yeah, as mentioned before, this is our website. Um, the Scholarship Opportunities Program website, if you go to, uh, I believe this is on the homepage. Um, we just have a couple slide throughs of our different upcoming events on the homepage. Um, but just to show you guys where a few of the import, more important pages are um, for, uh, for resources, as well as accessing past events um, and um, the blog, the scholars blogs, any, any other programs on campus as well. So uh, starting with the about tab, um, if we go down to here, uh, the honors and excellence program resources page is a really great resource um, for any students or anyone who's looking to get um, more involved on campus uh, with any other programs besides the scholarship opportunities program. Um, we have all the all the school based honors programs are linked here with descriptions as well as links to their individual websites and programs, um, business programs, scrolling further. Uh, we have the Research and Creative Excellence programs, uh, as well as the CHC, uh, which is the campus-wide honors uh, collegium, if you're unfamiliar. Um, we have Leadership and Service Excellence programs. So yeah, the list is it's relatively long. Uh, it's a fantastic way to get involved. Um, another, another good way, of course, is using campus groups. Um, if you're unfamiliar with campus groups, um, I believe they're rolling it out this quarter, um, if I'm correct. Um, it's, a, it's a really great tool um, at UCI. Um, 
I'll go to the website just to show you guys really quick. Um, so from campus groups, uh, you can log in using your UCI net ID and campus groups allows you to access a list of any upcoming events or involvement fairs or anything that's happening on campus um, from a virtual setting. So it has all the different events as well as Zoom links to those events listed on the homepage here, upcoming events. And I can go here and I can go through and I can register for any of these upcoming events for different um, uh, offices on campus. Uh, so that's just another way, really good way to get involved on campus. Um, but going back to our website, uh, to save it on topic here. Uh, if I go to the events tab, um, we're going to have the recording. Uh, we actually had a question previously in chat, I believe, um, from Maham um, on what, where we, the recording for this uh, outreach event will be located. Um, so if you go to the events tab on our website, scroll down to spring 2021 events and you go to here, um, this will be moved to past events um, and it will have links just like, so if I go to the prestigious scholarship workshops, we have links to um, the YouTube uh, recording of each of our workshops. Um, it'll be linked just like that under past events um, under the same spot. So if you're interested in rewatching this recording or going through any of our past events, uh, they're all here for you to access. You can just click on these links and uh, go, go check them out. So if I go to the scholarships page, uh, this is a really great overview of all of our different scholarships. Uh, we have two different cycles, again, our fall winter cycle, and then what we're covering right now, our spring summer cycle. Um, you have the, the brief information for each of the scholarships here, application deadline, citizenship requirements, um, as well as um, a link to the more in-depth information um, for each of the scholarships here. So you can learn a bit more about the NSF and any um, inf information or questions that you may have um, lingering. As so, as well as the scholarships um, page, events, and honors and access program resources, we have the SOP Scholars blogs. Um, this is a really great uh, resource for um, reaching out and reading about a lot of the past uh, Fulbright um, scholarship recipients um, and their experiences uh, studying abroad. Um, so, if you're interested in um, getting uh, in learning more about the uh, the past past applicants experiences um, it's a really great resource for that also it's really good to get connected to a lot of these students so if you're interested in um, learning about how, how their application period went and what it was like to apply for these programs a lot of these students can be found um, if, if you look up their names in the uci directory a lot of their emails and contact information can be located through the uci directory um, and you can get um, you can contact them and uh, ask about their experiences so it goes all the way back to um, 2010 it's another really great resource uh, for applying for these scholarships. And then one last one I wanted to cover was the other opportunities page. So other opportunities um, contain scholarships and programs that we don't necessarily do advising for here in the SOP office, but um, we have these listed here for students who aren't necessarily eligible for the SOP program, but are looking to find funding um, or scholarships for their graduate program or research. Um, so if we go to the other opportunities page under scholarships, um, it goes, it honestly goes on forever. Uh, we have a couple hundred here actually, uh, domestic opportunities for graduate study, and it goes on and on and on. Um, and each of these links go to their website. We have a brief description of each of the scholarships here. Uh, the link goes directly to the website. Um, and we don't offer specific, again, we don't offer specific advising for any of these scholarships or programs. Um, but we, but if you have any questions, um, just like general, generalized questions regarding them, um, of course we can, we can help answer those, um, and, and point you in the right direction as to where you, you can get better information. Yeah. So, so for, for, if for whatever reason you decide not to pursue advising or apply to the 21 scholarships that we advise for, um, you can look at this page, or even you can consult these opportunities in addition to the prestigious scholarships that we advise for. It's just a page for you to check out on your own time um, and additional sources of funding, but also some fellowships and internships. Thank you so and, much for that, Aline. Yeah. Um, Kiefer, if you're done with the website overview, we can start the Q&A. Yeah, for sure. Do you want to go back to the Q&A page? OK. There we go. So um, it's pretty self-explanatory. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or text it in the chat. Or if you um, are shy, go ahead and shoot us an email um, on our website or book an advising appointment. Um, and we would be happy to help you. So we'll just linger around to see if anyone asks any questions. 
Yeah. So I was initially going to apply to Rhodes and Fulbright. Those are like my top two main ones. But I mean, I have a good, great GPA right now. I'm a 3.9, but I'm still not convinced that I could uh, go all the way with Rhodes. Is it worth it to even apply for it if it's that competitive? Or should I just go for like Marshall or another or, or, uh, Gates Cambridge if that's a bit more accessible? I think one of the um, the way to answer this question is I think one of the fantastic um, aspects of our program is each scholarship really covers a um, specific aspect of research or graduate school that you're looking to pursue. Um, they all kind of have their own um, niche as to how they fit to your own which one which one would fit your experience better. So I think um, it based on your GPA, um, it sounds like you would be honestly high, a highly competitive applicant um, for for any of these scholarships with a three point nine. Um, and I would encourage you to read into the scholarships and find which one fits um, your exact experience and what you're looking, the program you're looking to pursue um, the most and apply for that one. Um, also to add on to that, oh, sorry, Sophia. Go ahead, Ali. Um, Joshua, you should note that for Rhodes, I believe it requires five to eight letters of recommendation, which is like the most you'll ever see in any of the scholarships that we advise for. So for me, that is a big factor to um, consider when deciding if I'm going to pursue that or not. And for any scholarship, I would suggest that you, you know, go onto YouTube or even our website. There should be past winning blogs, but also vlogs. I think those are pretty cool to watch, um, especially for the abroad scholarships. You can kind of see like a day in the life of a scholarship recipient and see if it's what you're cut out for. Um, just one last point is what I'd really recommend is still put it on your pre-application and then when you talk with the scholarship advisors they'll um, tell you which is the most feasible for you because you will be submitting like your resume CV too they'll look at that before they'll, they'll, they advise you so I would just recommend putting everything you're interested in and maybe for sure limiting it to um, the number of like a limited number of scholarships. I remember you mentioned uh putting no generalizations or cliches in our personal statement. Uh, can you specify a bit more, just elaborate on that? Like, what, what would that look like? So that would look like writing a cookie cutter essay, if you know what I mean. It's just like applying to, when we apply to UCI, you don't want an essay that there's a good chance other people will have written. Um, now everyone is different and unique, which is why personal statements give you a chance to let that uniqueness shine. And to be specific, I mean, like um, when we say no cliches or generalizations, we mean get very specific. Um, so if you say, I have a strong passion for helping others, that's a, that's a really big generalization and that can apply to most of our scholarship applicants. So you would have to reword that, but also give examples of what you've done in your past and plans that you have for the future. So in like your statement of grant purpose, for example, sure, you, you want to help others, but how so? What is your proposal? What is your plan? The project that you are putting forward that you need funding for um, or the research that you want to pursue, how is it going to impact other people in a positive way? I hope that answers your question. To kind of add on, once you submit your pre-application, like throughout the scholarship process, we'll be sending you with like old past winning apps um, specific to that scholarship. So for example, if you're interested in Rhodes, we'll send you a past winning app from a UCI Rhodes finalist, semi-finalist. So then you can kind of see what their writing was like um, and kind of, um, I guess, reflect on that based off of what your writing is like. Thank you. Um, this will be my last question. I don't want to take up too much uh, space if anyone else wants to ask something. But uh, since I already did the SOP prep and we submit like our own little short answer questions for that process, um, for the pre-app, can we use the SOP questions and our responses to them in the short answer, like for the pre-application? Okay. I, um we do use your pre-application materials like we did like we said earlier we there will be like an endorsement 
um, interview and we'll have to write an endorsement letter. So no, we do use like everything that you submit. Um, we use that to kind of help portray our story of you. So the more material you give us, the kind of better we're able to talk about you. But yes, short answer, you can use it. <laughs>